March 1944, and Charles Chaplin, my grandfather, is at the defendant's table in a courtroom in Los Angeles. Outside, Hollywood reporters and gossip columnists queue up in their hundreds waiting for a picture of one of the world's most famous men. If the jury here finds him guilty, Chaplin will be going to prison for as much as 23 years. This was one of the most sensational trials in the eyes of the press that Hollywood had ever known. The picture of Chaplin being fingerprinted was on every front page in the country. The news had trumped World War II for the banner headline day after day. Through the trial itself, Chaplin's attorney had told him off for doodling nervously as details of his private life were raked over again and again. Don't doodle, his attorney said. If the press get a hold of it, they'll have it analyzed and draw all sorts of conclusions from it. The appetite for news on the trial was unending. Why? Because this is a man beloved around the world for his character, The Little Tramp. The silent champion of the underdog who now stands accused of violating the law that was originally intended to combat forced prostitution and debauchery. The critical evidence against him? A train ticket. The story of how he got here has everything, wealth and fame and sex, and it leads to the upper reaches of power in America. Hollywood was increasingly turning political, and there were tough consequences for artists who had picked a side. This is the story of the opening battle in the war for the soul of the nation. From the BBC World Service and CBC Podcasts, this is Hollywood Exiles. I'm Una Chaplin. Episode 3, The Case Against Charles Chaplin. So, how did Charlie Chaplin end up on trial? I've said before, he was a complicated character. Questions have been raised over the years in books and articles, especially about his relationships with women. And authorities were about to exploit one of those relationships for their own purposes. <laughs> 1941, and Charlie Chaplin was doing just fine. He featured in only a handful of movies through the 30s, so his movie career wasn't what it had been. But his most recent film, The Great Dictator, was a commercial and critical success. And besides, he still had his studio, and he still had his distributor, United Artists. He was making plenty of money. But not long after the release of The Great Dictator, a woman would enter the picture who would change the course of his life, Joan Barry. There are many versions of the story of what happened between Barry and Chaplin, and there are still many points of contention. But to understand what happened to my grandfather and hundreds of other artists, I want to understand this part of the story as best I can. So I'm going to try and be as clear as I can about what we know and what we don't know. Joan Barry was 22 years old when she first came to Hollywood. She became a waitress with little or no prospects of breaking into the movie industry. But fortune smiled on Joan. She met a millionaire, J. Paul Getty. And through Getty, Barry met more acquaintances, one of whom introduced her to Charlie Chaplin. They were introduced at a group dinner. In his autobiography, Chaplin recalls, the lady in question was pleasant enough. I never thought of seeing her again. But Chaplin would see Joan Barry again very soon. She came to his house with their mutual friend for an afternoon of tennis. What happens next in the story is a matter of dispute. My grandfather recalls that he invited Joan, along with a number of others, to dinner again the following night. 
The day after, he got a call from her asking him to go to lunch. And after that lunch, he says, Joan told him that she planned to move to New York, but that she would stay if he wanted her to. I told her, quite frankly, not to remain on my account. And with that, I dropped her off outside her apartment and I bade her goodbye. But Joan did stay in Hollywood. In a later statement to law enforcement agencies, she recalled that same meeting quite differently. I told him I was going back to New York. He gave me his phone number and asked me to call him. I gave him mine. I didn't call him, and he called me about 10 in the morning. Joan Barry's FBI statement is clear that she felt pursued by Chaplin. Chaplin's autobiography disputes that version of events. Whoever called whom first, they began a relationship. According to accounts in FBI files, it started as a professional relationship. Chaplin recognized Barry's talents as an actor and put her under contract, signing her up for acting lessons, too. But their friendship soon turned into an affair. It was not a pretty affair. Joan became pregnant, and it looks like Charlie pressured her into having an abortion. And when he discovered that Barry hadn't been attending the acting classes he'd been paying for, he terminated her contract. The personal relationship deteriorated too, and by the spring of 1942, Chaplin had called an end to the affair. Around that same time, Chaplin's friends claimed to become concerned about Barry's mental health. Police reports and FBI files confirmed that she would show up drunk to his house, on one occasion crashing her Cadillac in the drive. The timeline of these events is confused and confusing. The accounts we have to rely on are no doubt affected by what happened later. What we know for sure is that by the fall of 1942, Charlie Chaplin didn't want to see Joan Barry anymore. He paid off her debts and bought a train ticket for her and her mother to go to New York. They took the train on the 5th of October. With all those ingredients, a wealthy, famous man and a spurned lover half his age, drunkenness and an unwanted pregnancy, it was only a matter of time before the story hit the gossip pages. Enter Hedda Hopper. Hedda Hopper's home one. Miss Hopper is just going on the air. Will you listen, please? The queen of gossip in 1940s Hollywood. Miss Hopper is just going on the air now. Please listen. She wrote for newspapers, and she was on the radio. She was the first to know, and the fastest to get the news out to her adoring fans. And Miss Hopper with Hollywood News and New York News from New York. Thank you, Mr. King, and hello, everybody. I can't tell you how excited I am about this hello coming from New York, because this is a town I know and love, and why shouldn't I? I spend most of my life here. Right off the bat, I'd like to tell you that the fans are about the most helpful people here. I went from the plane to luncheon at 21. The fans Fans outside told me about Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz's marriage even before the papers got it. They had been she writes in this time. very chatty, informal way, which is really a gossipy tone that she takes. And her readers just fall in love with her. Jennifer Frost is Hedda Hopper's biographer. She's got an estimated 32 million readers of her column. And so you think about every day, seven days a week, she's writing her gossip column about Hollywood, about, you know, different films that are coming out, who's getting cast and what. Hedda Hopper decides which movies are good and bad, which ones are worth your time and money. Her column and radio show make her one of the most powerful people in Hollywood, partly because her columns didn't begin and end with the movies. They had a political bite, too. She really cared about women and women's rights. Uh, she believed women should be involved in politics. She voted regularly. She, uh, you know, thought about running for office. And she was always advocating for women in Hollywood. So on the one hand, Hedda Hopper is very progressive when it comes to women's rights, but that was in sharp contrast to her otherwise deeply conservative values. 
that's what made me just absolutely both fascinated by her and frightened by her. What she always did was pinpoint stars and screenwriters and directors who had liberal, more liberal politics um, or left politics, and she targeted them. And so that's an example of your grandfather. When does she write, start writing about him? Does, does she like dislike him straight away? Does she kind of like love him, then start to hate him as tides change? Or like, what's the history there? She knew him early on because she's in the industry, you know, in the 1920s and working for MGM. And she always does say, and even later, uh, that she admired his genius, right? She always said he was an excellent actor, although even that is not enough. But professional respect aside, Hedda Hopper thought Charlie Chaplin didn't treat women very well. She also really really didn't like Chaplin's movies and the messages that she thought they conveyed. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. In 1940, Charlie Chaplin had released The Great Dictator as Europe flared into war. This movie was his most political yet. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent. U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Democrat, was increasingly eager for America to join the conflict, to combat the scourge of fascism. But lots of voices in America did not want to get involved with the war. For them, Chaplin's rallying cry at the end of The Great Dictator was distinctly un-American. Let us fight for a world of reason! A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! One of the loudest voices among them was Hedda Hopper. She's very upset, uh, not just at the film The Great Dictator, which we would argue is an interventionist film, right? It's basically saying that, well, (laughs) Hitler and the Nazis are bad and that the U.S. needs to intervene in this war. It's not just that. But she also didn't appreciate that Charlie Chaplin, for example, showed up at fundraisers for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president who was running for re-election. So she then starts writing about him in in her column. And like, does she even write about, does she critique his films? Well, she, she wants him to fail. Right. She wants his films to fail. So in her columns, she'll definitely talk about oh, he's having trouble getting people to come to his movies. Oh, the publicity agents are having trouble getting him good publicity, etc. So she's looking for any little criticism that she can publish about Chaplin, and she just doesn't miss a chance at, at doing that. Oh my God, I'm just reading one of the articles now that she wrote about The Great Dictator. She said, but his speech at the finish of the picture left me colder than an icicle. My goodness. What many people said is she took things personally. And in 1938, when she starts her column, she wants people to kowtow to her. She recognizes the power in the industry and that she's dependent on the industry for her news and information. But she wanted some respect back, right? She wanted people to uh, try to get interviews with her and try to get into her column. Well, your grandfather didn't need that and didn't really want to waste time with that. And she took that, she took offense of that. And one of her biographers even said that he insulted her by not kowtowing to her. There were many reasons Hedda Hopper had it in for Charlie Chaplin, but she had a fight on her hands because even by this point in time, and this is in the early 1940s, he was still one of the most beloved actors on the planet. She's not in the majority. So even though, absolutely, she's got this audience of 32 million readers, you know, an estimated 32 million readers, you know, still the country is, you know, 160 million people, right? So it's not that she captures the majority opinion. Um, And that movie was very successful, right? So it's not that her critique damaged The Great Dictator. It didn't hurt The Great Dictator at all. So that, but that's one of the things about her, even when she's isolated, or you could argue even marginalized, right? She doesn't give up. In 
Hopper's campaign was in public view, but behind the scenes, there was another far more powerful individual who was keeping an eye on Charlie Chaplin. I want to talk to you fighting men and women about the battle of the United States. You may wonder what I mean by this. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had kept half an eye on Charlie Chaplin for decades. In the early 1920s, Hoover had been assigned to the Bureau of Investigation where he'd helped to lead the hunt for communist infiltrators. His office started a file on my grandfather, the earliest known file we have on communist activities in Hollywood. Every community in the nation it was a struggle against enemy agents who had been sent to this country to disrupt our industries, destroy our morale, and damage the impact of our fighting army. Since then, Hoover had been promoted. He was now the director of the Bureau. And the Bureau itself got an upgrade. It was now called the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. The Battle of the United States was a victory for us, and there is no one to whom I would rather give this information first than to you. Through the 1930s, the FBI's focus was on running down people smuggling alcohol across state lines during the United States Prohibition, and then on tracking down criminal gangs, most famously, Bonnie and Clyde. Throughout it all, Hoover cared about something greater than upholding the law. He believed in a vision of America. In Hoover, we definitely see at the broadest level, a concern about American society. Here's John Spartelati, the author of J. Edgar Hoover Goes to the Movies. A concern about protecting what he defines as the American way of life, which is a phrase that we see in FBI files quite a bit. The American way of life is such a curious phrase. It can mean whatever we want it to mean. Democracy, morality, freedom, Behind each of those words lies a tension. What I mean by freedom might not be what you mean by freedom. Indeed, my idea of freedom might threaten your idea of freedom. For J. Edgar Hoover, his idea of freedom was always under threat, from outside and from within. The FBI really did see Hollywood as a threat, first and foremost for cultural reasons, that they really, and you see this in the actual FBI files, that they believed that film could be used as a medium for communist propaganda, and that in an age when more people watched movies than read, that this could have a powerful impact on, as they said, the minds and culture of uh, the American people and, and around the globe. So... They started with the premise that communists who worked in Hollywood must ipso facto be trying to insert communist propaganda into films. And the perceived threat of communism becomes even more acute when America is finally dragged into the war. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. After December 7th, 1941, the U.S. can no longer sit out the fight. That has consequences for domestic politics, and it makes Hoover and the FBI very nervous. The Second World War had put the United States in an alliance with the Soviet Union, and the Bureau's fear was that American communists could use that and could therefore present their activities, their campaign, their agenda, as being patriotic, because it was all part of this large grand alliance. And part of that campaign occurred, from their perspective, in Hollywood. So in 1942, a campaign that started 20 years before with Charlie Chaplin was quietly restarted. The FBI was actively on the lookout for communism in the motion picture industry. And it's right about this time that Chaplin makes himself the perfect target for Hoover. October 1942, Carnegie Hall, New York. (laughs) 
Since the success of The Great Dictator, Chaplin had become increasingly engaged in the issue of the war in Europe. He described his film as anti-Nazi and would later say that Nazis had made inroads into American institutions. He was worried about Hitler and Nazism. He clearly did see those values as counter to his own. And anyone who was fighting Nazi Germany needed as much help as they could get. So, 10 months into America's war, Charlie Chaplin found himself in a grand theater in New York City to support the American Committee for Russian War Relief. Those who were there said that my grandfather spoke passionately about opening up a second front in Europe, supporting the Russians in their fight. News reports describe his speech as courageous. 3,000 people heard Charlie Chaplin say, thank God for President Roosevelt heard him praise the president for releasing a prominent communist leader from prison and hailing his Russian comrades. It left investigators in the FBI with little doubt as to where Chaplin's politics lay. Just about everything Chaplin said was in line with U.S. government policy. But to FBI investigators, the speech was more proof of Chaplin's unsavory, even un-American politics. The press, particularly the more conservative elements, went wild. One columnist wrote, Chaplin has lately said that he was pro-communist, which means only that he is anti-American. There was no going back from this. He did receive support, though particularly from fellow artists. One Dalton Trumbo wrote to him directly, I am one of millions of people who support and respect your courageous and patriotic work. And this letter would do Dalton Trumbo no favors in the future. The resulting FBI file on Charlie Chaplin was 1,900 pages long. Within those pages are articles, correspondence, and interviews. There are also critiques of some of his movies, most notably featuring The Little Tramp, who'd made him so famous. The Little Tramp, who audiences all over the world found so relatable. The character who'd kicked the immigration official's butt in The Immigrant was still causing a stir. 20 years later. Charlie Chaplin's Russian war relief speech got him into hot water politically. And now, the gossip pages were about to play their part in bringing him down. He got back to his hotel after a successful night in front of the crowd at Carnegie Hall to a mound of messages Joan Barry was staying nearby and wanted to see him. It was two weeks since Chaplin had bought her train ticket to New York. When Barry called again, Chaplin answered. She told him she just wanted to come up and say hello. He said yes. But he asked a friend who was staying in the suite with him not to leave them alone. Chaplin recalls the meeting took no more than half an hour before Barry left. And Barry herself claimed the two had sex. As for the friend who wasn't supposed to leave them alone, he says Chaplin offered to drop Barry back at her hotel. And then he, the friend, went to bed, leaving them alone. And what happened that night between two consenting adults, we will never know for sure. But whatever happened would have consequences for Chaplin for the rest of his life. Two months later, on the night of the 23rd of December, a car pulls up at Chaplin's Los Angeles mansion late at night. A woman gets out of the car and using a ladder scales the wall at the house breaking in through the window. Once inside, she produces a gun. This woman is Joan Barry. She later claims she bought the gun to kill herself, 
but whatever her intentions, Chaplin talks her down. His sons are in the next room. When Barry shows up again a week later, he decides to call the police. Barry is given a 90-day suspended sentence for vagrancy and ordered to leave town. Six months later, Barry returns. She is now pregnant and claims the unborn child is Charlie Chaplin's. This time, she doesn't want her pregnancy to be a secret. She wants Chaplin to acknowledge that he is the father of the baby, and she doesn't care who knows it. Joan Barry turns to Hedda Hopper. So when she gets wind of Joan Barry's situation, she gets her hands on Barry right away. Hopper guides her, helps her, and promotes her side of the story. So when she hears there's a woman who is, you know, uh, you know, going after your grandfather and wanting him to, you know, stay in a relationship with her, you know, et cetera, et cetera, she's on to it right away. And she publishes a piece saying, you know, right from the beginning, this poor girl, 24 years old, this poor girl has been, you know, basically abused by Chaplin. Hopper's columns are sensational, but the crazy thing is that she wasn't just reporting on the story. She was as much part of the story. She helps Barry initiate Barry's case against your grandfather for the paternity suit. So she's behind it all the way. She is part and parcel initiator and instigator of all of that whole incident. This is the point where things get pretty weird, where all the different threads come together. Charlie Chaplin, Joan Barry, the gossip columnists, and the FBI. Here's John Spartilotti again. At the moment when Chaplin is only facing the paternity trial, Hedda Hopper writes a column at one point where she says that, that Chaplin will soon have something much bigger to worry about. How could she know this? Hopper has a relationship with the FBI, is one of the press figures that Hoover occasionally leaks things to in order to smear people that he has a vendetta against for whatever reason. As extraordinary as that might sound, it's true. Hedda Hopper, Hollywood gossip columnist, and J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI's all-powerful director, knew one another, and she knew his agents on the ground in Los Angeles. She would pass on Hollywood gossip to him, and he would supply her with information in return. So there is a chance that Hopper knew what was coming down the tracks for Chaplin, something far more serious than a paternity suit. The reason that he finds himself in a Los Angeles courthouse facing upwards of two decades in prison. It comes back to that train ticket. I think there's a pretty long-standing antipathy on Hoover's part for Chaplin. And it's very clear to me that he's rather opportunistic in going after Chaplin and that he'll, he'll work with the tools that he has. And, and the circumstances of Chaplin's affair with Barry and the fact that he paid for her to, to visit him in New York gives Hoover that opportunity. Hoover directs his agents to open an investigation into a violation of something called the Mann Act, also known as the White Slave Traffic Act. And the intent of the law was to counter prostitution, to counter sex trafficking. So it's a good law from that perspective, but it, the language was very loose. And what the law did was it forbade anyone from transporting women across interstate lines for immoral purposes. Well, that gave a great deal of elasticity for people who wanted to, to define immoral purposes as simply, for example, having sex out of marriage. So if you transported a woman across state lines for the purpose of, you know, of having a relationship with that person, you could be charged with a violation of the Mann Act. So, if Charlie Chaplin had paid for Joan Barry's train ticket to New York, which he had, and then had what the Mann Act labeled immoral practices with her when he saw her, he could be in violation of the law. They were successful in building enough of a case that it resulted in a trial. If this failed, there could well be more trials. Government legal archives reveal that cases were being built against Chaplin for conspiracy and violation of civil rights laws. 
The Mann Act trial alone resulted in more column inches about Charlie Chaplin. So that was doing that broader work of conflating Chaplin's what was called in those days moral turpitude, his sexual sins, let's say, with his politics. And so if you can't prove communist uh, membership, right, if you can't successfully attack him for his political views, but if you can tarnish his image on these sexual grounds and then at the same time remind people consistently of his political views, you accomplish maybe some of the same tactics. Charlie Chaplin's image would arguably never recover. It was later proved conclusively that Charlie Chaplin was not and could not be the father of Joan Barry's baby. He took a blood test that showed a man with his blood type could not be the father of this child. And as for the Man Act trial, by the time the jury retired to consider the verdict, Chaplin was pretty confident in the outcome. But they take that much longer than he'd expected to reach their conclusion. Chaplin hadn't been allowed to leave the courthouse while the jury considered their verdict. Standing by the defendant's bench, he later wrote that his heart was thumping in his throat. But the verdict is not guilty. The damage, though, has been done. Chaplin thanks his legal team and shakes the hand of each member of the jury. He recalls that one of them said to him, it's all right, Charlie, it's still a free country. I think this is a sad story, sad for my grandfather and sad for Joan Barry. But notwithstanding their personal turmoil, which I have great sympathy for, the part that concerns me most is that their private lives got dragged through the public arena to advance other people's political agendas. It's that both Barry and Chaplin were used by powerful manipulative forces to generate public opinion. In 1947, in his office in the Department of Justice building in Washington, D.C., J. Edgar Hoover hears the news of Chaplin's acquittal. Now a decision needed to be taken on what to do with the remaining charges against him. Hoover decides the charges should be dropped. The last thing he wants to do is make a martyr of Charlie Chaplin. But... Hoover and his agents are convinced there is a case to be made against subversives in Hollywood. And this is no time, he thinks, to start easing off. It's time to start ramping up. What we see, in, especially in the Hollywood investigation, is, is Hoover driving it. Hoover writing and sending directives to his agents especially the, the Los Angeles office, asking for updates, asking for reports, asking for material, asking it to step up its investigation, asking for more information on this dangerous propaganda. Hoover is directing his agents to find that evidence and to report on it. So the special agent in charge of Los Angeles is left to kind of innovate some sort of strategy for detecting this communist propaganda. This is about to get much bigger than Charlie Chaplin. Next time on Hollywood Exiles, Hollywood comes under ideological scrutiny. Ayn Rand thought that art shouldn't be propaganda, but it does have a tremendous impact.
Hollywood Exiles is a production of BBC Audio Wales for the BBC World Service and CBC Podcasts. I'm Una Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was voiced by Paul Ryan. Our producers are Glyn Tansley and Megan Jones. Music by Phil Channel and sound design by Kathy Robinson and Phil Channel. Our theme is by Nick Thorburn. Executive producer for BBC Audio is Martin Smith. At the BBC World Service, Prabjeet Baines is senior producer and John Manell is the podcast commissioning editor. At CBC Podcasts, Jeff Turner is senior producer. Chris Oak is executive producer. And Arif Nirani is the director. Thank you for listening. <laughs>